Welcome back to True Woman 201. Today we'll be talking about the third element of biblical womanhood mentioned in the curriculum in Titus chapter two. Now, if you were going to disciple a younger woman, what are the major topics you'd want to cover? Well, you'd probably want to teach her how to pray, how to study God's word, how to witness. And those are crucial topics and they're definitely part of the general educational curriculum for all believers. But isn't it interesting that none of these things appears on Paul's list of required topics to get a major in biblical womanhood? When scripture addresses what women need to know, it brings up things that relate specifically to marriage and motherhood and the home. Now that's not to say that every woman will get married and have kids, but it does indicate that the Lord wants us to love what he loves. Married or not, he wants us to have a deep affection for the family. Oh, Mary, it looks like you have a call from oh, you guys. somebody really special. Okay, what? Hold, okay, hold on, hold on, so everybody can hear this. Today is Mary's 32nd, 32nd anniversary. Teacher. And I asked you a little bit ago if you had talked to Brent yet. Yeah. And you said, no, we had an early call time. So look who's here live and look in person. Who's here. On Skype. Good yeah. Whoops. This is perfect timing, Brent, because we're getting we're talking about affection for family, loving <laughs> husbands and children. And it sounds like I, I know Mary really loves you. He's you want to tell her you too. love her? Don't don't make us do this. <laughs> I'm trying not to smear my makeup. So Brent, 32 years later, what do you love and appreciate about Mary that you didn't so much realize? back then? Uh, well, I think some of the things that you, you know, realize and, uh, and appreciate, they just uh, just get better. So I, I think I uh, have said it's it's kind of been, for my end anyway, like a uh, uh, little bit like a fairy tale. I know it hasn't been perfect, but it, you know, I still have to poke myself. It still seems like a fairy, a fairy tale and that uh, you sort of see just God's working out that marriage is, is a... Uh, a phenomenal um, a blessing that he, he gives people, and we have been recipients of that. Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, it's true, and it's you know it's also true that a couple, a uh, family that uh, prays together, uh, it's they stay together, and then they play together. It's true. <laughs> it's really, really true. So the Lord has such a wonderful plan there. And uh, I'm still, like I said, I got to poke myself today. I can't believe I'm married to this, uh, uh, this amazing woman. Wow. Well, I know some of our listeners want to know, does Mary Cassian really love her husband and children the way she talks about in her books? Are you and, recording this? Yes, we are. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so you want to oh. just give a test, a witness to uh, whether she's the real thing? Yeah, yeah, she is a real thing. That's, that's uh, you know, people have asked me that too. And, and yeah, she is. She's the real deal. So uh, what she writes about is uh, accurate. Uh, uh, you know her a bit, Nancy. You, you get, you have a relationship, a friendship with her. And you uh, see, you know, Mary can be very, uh, I guess, serious when it comes to the things of the Lord and the Word of God. And yet uh, she's just a whole bunch of fun uh, too. They, that's not either or, they're both yeah. and. And uh, it's it's very very true. It's very real. And her you know heart for Christ is real. And uh, you see that just in uh, things she does. She serves uh, our uh, our family, our extended family. Her most recently, her parents who are getting uh, uh, on an age, mm -hmm. and she serves them in a very very special way. So. I'm so glad. Thank you, Nancy. I've been able to talk to Mary just face yes. to face. It's just very special. We've actually had a little bit of trouble connecting over the last few days. We we've talked a little bit, but it kept cutting out. So, well, we wanted to nice. bring you a little closer together Aww. on your anniversary. Thanks for sharing her with us. So, uh, both of you just have a great time with the rest of your sessions, and uh, be thinking of uh, you and uh, praying for you. Uh, love you, and I miss you lots. Okay, miss you too, sweetheart. Love hey. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Oh, so bye. fun that you did this. <laughs> Happy anniversary. Thank you. I can't believe you were recording that. It seemed appropriate as we're talking about loving husbands and children. Yes. That we should 
have you able to talk to your husband? Aww, now we so got to reset to how we got to this loving husbands and children mm -hmm. thing. We're in Titus 2. We're yes. talking about the elements of biblical womanhood. And we started with discernment that a true woman has right thinking that's mm -hmm. rooted in God's word. And then in the last session, we talked about how she has honor and reverence, reverence for God. And then as we get to that Titus 2 passage, this is perfect on your anniversary. It says that older women are to teach the younger women to train them to love their husbands and children. Mm. Now you'd think that would not have to be trained. Well, you would think you go into marriage and you're so much in love that it's just going to be really easy for the next 30, 40, 50 years and that nothing will ever rock the boat and make it difficult. But it, it does need training. And I know that I've benefited from older women in my life who have been examples to me. Um, I think of one woman and her name is Ann Gill and uh, she won't mind me telling this, but she, she, I watched her every morning. I was over at her home one day and her husband was leaving for work. And as he left, uh, she ran to the window and she waved goodbye. And this was an older woman. They had already been married probably 30 years or more. And I thought, that's just, that's just really incredible that she would do that. And so I thought, okay, well, I guess maybe I'll start doing that. And so when Brent leaves in the morning and before I go to work in my office, I, uh, I uh, started doing that, went to the window and took the dog with me and the dog sat there and I sat there and we waved goodbye. And it was so interesting to me that probably um, five years later, I think it was in a church environment, someone was asking Brent, what is the measure of success in life? And he said, and he tears welled up in his eyes and he says, success is driving off and seeing your wife and your dog waving to you in the window. <laughs> it was so wow. precious. Yeah. And I just think of so many examples of women in my life who have nurtured me and taught me as I've watched their marriages and watched how they relate to their husbands and how instructive that has been for me. Which you're now doing for your daughters in law yes. as the next the baton is being mm -hmm. passed to that next generation. So mm -hmm. now you're the model and the one training the younger women. And uh, in this, let me just back up here in this whole Titus 2 passage, yeah. we hear about loving husbands, loving children. And then there are a couple other things that we're going to be coming to later in this series that have to do also with family. It talks about being kind, being working at home, being submissive to husbands. And when you put all these elements together, I think one thing that really stands out is the priority that God puts on the home, mm -hmm. um, that this is not inconsequential. It's not secondary as a discipleship issue. This is, it really matters. This is core. This is core. Core teaching. And the interesting thing, Nancy, is that it's core teaching, but not only for marrieds, it's core teaching for everyone in the family of God, because family and marriage and all of the earthly symbols that we have teach us about the kingdom of God and teach us truths that are eternal truths about the kingdom of God. And I think uh, Paul was saying in First Corinthians, Paul says, don't be so concerned if you're not married, because singleness is also important, but you get to participate more fully in the marriage to which all earthly marriages point. You have more time to devote to that relationship and to the gospel and to spreading the word of God. So this is older women saying to younger women, you need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. This is God's norm. He may not have that for you. And you still want to be one who loves family. But uh, there's an assumption, which I don't know that our culture makes, that this no. is a good thing that marriage is a good thing, that having children is a good thing. And, and that's something we even want those who never have a husband or children to still believe that marriage and family are good. And I, it strikes me that if marriage and family and children are symbols that point us and display the gospel, is it any wonder that in our society, Satan attacks at that very point that we're to display the gospel, the story of Jesus in our marriages, and Satan just works hard to destroy marriage, to destroy the concept of marriage, to, to make us devalue it, to make us devalue men, to devalue children, devalue everything that is precious in God's sight. He's been working on that attack program ever since Genesis chapter 3. Mm -hmm. And what an incredible opportunity in a world that is so, whose families are so dysfunctional mm -hmm. for Christian marriages 
Christian homes to say there's a better way, not just because the family can be great, but because it points to a greater eternal reality that is the family of God that we're wanting to make people hungry for. Exactly. That's what families are to do is to make make people hungry for the family of God and for the type of relationships that we can have in the family of God. Okay, I don't want to skip over this word in the text that um, the older women are to teach the young women, train them to love mm. their husbands, love their children. Now, there are different words in the Greek language that can reference different aspects of love. They kind of overlap and aren't always clear cut and distinct, but there's a kind of um, that, that agape love we read about that's God's unconditional love toward those who don't deserve it. And certainly that kind of love is important mm -hmm. in marriage and, and then family. And eros, which is a sexual sexuality, love. sexual kind of a love. But there's a different kind of love, or it, it fills it out in a, a little different way, the word that's used here. Explain that. Phileo, which is brotherly love or just affection. And that's the city of Philadelphia. Where I'm you, from. Where is that where you're from? I am. You're from Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And it, that there's a there's a connection there between that word Philadelphia and brotherly love, which is phileo in Greek, and th that is the word that's used in this passage. Really interestingly, teach the older women are to teach the younger women to like their husbands, to be affectionate towards them, to have an affection for husbands and children. In fact, let me read a couple different translations here of that mm. phrase. One says to be attached to their husbands. Another says to be fond of their husbands or to be affectionate toward their husbands. So this sounds like a lot more than just fulfilling your marital duty to your husband. Mm -hmm. This has to do with enjoying him. Now, I'm a single woman. I'm out of my element here. So, but I've watched you and Brent and I've watched you as a wife married now 32 years. 32. Still enjoying each other. I love that when we brought him on by Skype a few moments ago, you both teared up. I'm going to tear up right now. <laughs> you, you still enjoy yeah. each other. Yeah, yeah, we do. And there's something, I always say there's something about old love. There's something about that love, that, that, that affection that just grows deeper and deeper. And agape love really is the love that says, I choose to love you. I, I will love you no matter what. But phileo is more the, the, I am really enjoying loving you. Certainly that's in agape as well. As we said, these all overlap, but there's a little bit of a different flavor where it's, it's, I like being with you. I, I, I like our relationship and what that looks like and that God has blessed us in this way. Okay. I see that sparkle in your eyes and it's very beautiful to see, but I also know we have a lot of people listening to or watching this who say that is not what my marriage mm. is like at all. We've been married 32 years. Maybe we've hung in there, but it's we just tolerate each other. Mm -hmm. It's hard. So the, the luster is gone. The sparkle is gone. The romance is gone. And they're saying, I don't even like this guy. Um, and maybe he's feeling the same way toward her. So how, and I know there's not just a sentence answer, but how do you cultivate and keep tender and fresh that like in your marriage, that affection, that enjoyment? That's a good question. And I think that our passage talks about older women coming alongside the younger ones. I think that on a practical level, it's very good to be in community and to be encouraging one another. And when you hit those bumps or those really tough times in marriage, to keep our eyes on what's important and, and to lean in and to get strength from the Lord. Because um, the opposite of that would be when you see a quirk, which every person has them. You have them, mm -hmm. Brent has them. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I have some. Um, but I'm not trying to live with a husband. You are. And when you see those quirks, I think what so many women do is go to their girlfriends or their mom or their kids, worse of all probably, and say, can you believe he, you know, and to then diss and bad mouth and mm -hmm. focus on those quirks. And then you get people chiming in. Yeah, I know. You should see what my husband does. Mm -hmm. And none of that breeds or builds affection. That's in right. marriage. I think gratitude is actually huge for maintaining that affection and just remembering the things that you do like and being grateful for those. Or the things you used to like or the that maybe you you've forgotten like, and you've haven't forgotten. nurtured. Or the new things and being... Elizabeth Elliot once said in a radio program, and I heard her say this and it struck me so profoundly that I wrote it down and I put it as a saying above 
in, in my place of where I sit and, and have my quiet time. And it was, it is always possible to be grateful for what is given rather than um, bitter about what is withheld. One or the other will become a way of life. Oh, and say that again. That's so good. It is always possible to be grateful for what is given rather than resentful over what is withheld. One or the other will become a way of life. Yeah. And what a picture that is mm -hmm. to a watching world that can't hardly tolerate living in the same house with each other in so many cases to say there is beauty in this relationship of marriage that points to the ultimate marriage of Christ mm -hmm. and his church. It makes the gospel believable. And there's even beauty in the difficulty. I have seen women who have had very difficult husbands and that's not the case for me, but I have walked that path yes. with many women yes. whose husbands are harsh, yes. uh, demanding, angry, very difficult men to live with. There's beauty in the perseverance and there's beauty. I, I, I think of the, the marriages that speak the most of the gospel to me and, and the good ones do. But the ones that really proclaim the gospel loudly are those ones where the women are able to say, it was very tough, but by the grace of God and with his help, we've been faithful. And in many cases, not all, but in many, that perseverance, that loving through it all becomes transformational and bears fruit in the life of the difficult partner. Yes, it can so be true. really It can really change. God can change that person as that man lives in the context of a woman who really loves him. We've heard so many testimonies of that through the True Woman movement, of testimonies of women who have walked that difficult path and who have wrestled with this passage in Titus and everything it says and said, I am going to hang on to this. I'm going to believe that what God says is true mm -hmm. and I'm going to apply it in my life. And we've seen transformation happen yeah. in those women's yeah. lives. We focused a lot on liking your husband, loving your husband mm -hmm. here, but also part of this passage is affection for children. It is something that the Lord wants us to train younger women in. And I don't think that, uh, I, I think that this is for, for women, even who are not married, who do not know if they will be married at whether or not the, the Lord has that in their future. But I think as an older woman at this stage in life, it is on, uh, it is my responsibility to teach younger women to value husbands, to value children, and to love children. So even if those women aren't married, even if they're career women, if, if it's a lawyer, a doctor, um, a CEO, a, a, a woman who, who there's no husband on the horizon, but still to have an affection for children. Now, she doesn't have to be the one volunteering in the nursery, but still to have, to have a real appreciation and affection for God's family plan. And I think part of that means even the willingness to embrace children if God does give them to mm -hmm. your family. You've watched this in your own family with the gal, precious gal who married your son and uh, had been successful in the corporate world, in the marketplace, and now has had a child. And you've seen her really embrace the change, the adjustments involved. It is a whole different world. It is a whole different world. And I don't think it was always easy. My, my oldest daughter-in-law was very successful in the oil and gas uh, business as an accountant uh, at a very high level and uh, married my son. And so she gave up those heels and skirts and business power suits for, for, you know, the little baby burpee and getting spit up on all yeah. the time. And it, it hasn't always been easy because some days I think she, she feels lonely or she misses the excitement and, and of, of the other world, but it's been so precious to watch her just fall in love with her family and to just flourish and bloom uh, in the responsibilities that God has given her at this stage in her life. And again, God's way tends to go counter to the culture. Mm -hmm. So the culture is children are a burden. Uh, you don't want to get pregnant. That'll mess up your body. You won't be able to be this trim fit young thing that you were when you were a you know, teenager. And children do definitely change the mm -hmm. life, uh, a woman's life. But the heart of God is to embrace children. The heart of a true woman is to love husband, love children, 
respect and value marriage, value children, uh, whatever his plan is for your life, that you're seeking him for that, you're embracing that. And yet, without falling off on the other extreme, which some do, which is idolizing exactly. family as if that becomes a God. And I think that's an important caution because I've seen that also in Christian women's lives in the church where family and marriage becomes the idol. It becomes the reason for a woman's existence. And the reason for a woman's existence is glorifying God. And if she's married, she does that through marriage and through children. However, her reason is to glorify God. That's her purpose in life. And it's the same purpose as for, for a woman who has no children and no husband. Uh, but, but it is, it can become an idol where everything is about the kids, everything is about the family, everything is about the marriage, and they lose sight of the grand purpose. And even having children, the purpose is to expand the kingdom of God. Yes. You're supposed to be raising those children, having children, for the purpose of expanding the kingdom of God, to raise those children in the ways of the Lord. And releasing them over to God's kingdom purposes, not holding on to them to make you happy, mm -hmm. but giving them over to God for his kingdom. Mm -hmm.